Hey friends, I'm Leah Carey, a Schmex and relationship coach, and today we're talking about the good, the bad, and the terrible advice that Dear Abby offers to her readers. Do you swear by Dear Abby or at Dear Abby? <laughs> Drop a comment. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Now let's dive in. Seething in New York writes, Dear Abby, my fiance has a number of male friends she has known for years. Then he goes on to describe some of the ways that they touch her that he feels are inappropriate. At a recent party, another one had his hands on her back or shoulder whenever he spoke to her and she was wearing a silk blouse. Prior to that, she had left with him to go to the ATM holding his hand. When I tell her I'm upset about this, especially that she's allowing it to go on, she tells me they've been friends for years and there's nothing schmecky going on. I would never touch another woman who is in a committed relationship. Advice? Abby responds, Dear Seething, yes, your fiancé has made it plain that she just doesn't plan to change. This is why you should end the engagement. Well, friends, <laughs> so let's just start with the fact that people from different cultures have different customs. So the letter writer has... <laughs> They're bowling with furniture upstairs or something. <laughs> so... The letter writer has not said where their spouse is from or whether they're from different cultures, but that would absolutely be my first question. For instance, if this spouse came from France or from Italy, I might think, yeah, that's kind of par for the course. Like the strictures around personal touch are very different there than they are in the US. Similarly, and this is one that always surprises me when it comes up. Arab men will literally walk down the street holding hands. So the, the expectations around personal space and personal touch are different based on where you are in the world. So if I were working with this couple, the first thing that I would do is ask the wife, what does touch mean to you? Where do you come from? What are the cultures and the customs around touch in your country, in your culture, in your family, perhaps in your religion, um, you know, and in your social group? Help me to understand, help us to understand what the assumptions are that you're working with. So let me give you a story from my own background to demonstrate. I was working at the Goodspeed Opera House, which is this beautiful little theater that does uh, musicals in Connecticut. And I was working on the backstage crew as the assistant stage manager. And over the course of several months of working really hard together in, you know, very non-traditional, non-business, nine to five, we end up having a very close relationship and theater people tend to be a pretty touchy-feely crowd. So touch does not ring the same alarm bells in theater as it does, you know, in the corporate world. So during each show, I had to climb uh, this wall ladder from the deck to the second story um, so that I could, you know, uh, throw something down to the stage. After a couple of weeks, it is just running like clockwork. The same people are in the same place at the same time doing the same things. Predictable patterns. So every night I'm climbing the ladder as this other crew member crosses below the ladder and he reaches up and he pats me on the ass. Now, in theater, nothing. <laughs> like, this is... This is just a complete non-issue. It's friendly. We laugh. Then it just became part of the routine. Every night he would reach up and pat my ass. So we get to the end of that show. And I was moving into Manhattan, into New York City. And um, I was working as a temp for a while, uh, while I got my feet under me. 
And one of my very first jobs that I got sent to, and this is a whole other story, um, but I got sent to Martha Stewart Living's headquarters. I get there. Okay. Tangent, because this is just a really funny story. I get to Martha Stewart Living and nobody can figure out who sent for me. (laughs) So I was sitting in the lobby, just kind of twiddling my thumbs for a few minutes, waiting for somebody to come out and get me and tell me where to go. But nobody can figure out who I'm supposed to be there covering. Somebody finally comes out and is like, we don't know why you're here. But as long as you're here, uh, are you any good at wrapping gifts? And I was like, I mean, I'm okay. I'm not great. And he takes me <laughs> into this uh, like conference room where there are huge stacks of whatever Martha Stewart's latest book was at that time. And he said, we need all of these wrapped by tonight for this party that she's having for like donors or I don't know. The hoi polloi. No, not the hoi polloi. The opposite of the hoi polloi. The, you know, the big people. Um, And he gave me this huge roll of craft paper, brown craft paper and twine. And so I spent a couple of hours wrapping gifts for Martha Stewart, which I just think is the funniest thing ever. Back to the original tangent. Um, But then they finally figured out where they wanted me. While I was sitting there covering the phones, I hear these people, the other workers, having conversations about how the day before they'd had a um, harassment awareness class. And, you know, these things tend to be absolutely terrible. They don't really give you a lot of information about how to handle anything. But what you do come out of it with is a bunch of jokes about how silly the seminar was. And so all of these people are walking around and making these jokes about how like, oh, is it okay if I touch you on the shoulder? Or, oh, is it okay if I brush past you with my elbow? Comments and questions that come from a place of, I just learned this thing, but I don't know what to do with it. It feels incredibly awkward. I don't know how to deploy it. And so I'm just going to make a joke out of it. And I sat there thinking, if these people could have seen me two weeks ago... (laughs) with my backstage friend slapping me on the ass every night and it just being a part of our work day, they would have plots. Um, so, okay. Back from tangent two, back from tangent one, back to the original question. Different communities, different cultures have different expectations and assumptions around touch. So, The first question is not, why is she doing this to me? Or why is she allowing somebody to disrespect her or disrespect me? The first question is, what does this mean to you? Why does this feel okay for you when it doesn't feel okay for me? And there can be no real effective conversation until we have a shared language about what this touch means. If I'm working with them and I ask her, what does this touch mean to you? And she says, I just live in a really, you know, touchy feely world. Yeah, he doesn't see me doing this with my work friends because that's not the atmosphere. But with my other French friends or theater friends or whatever, this is just a part of our culture together. It's not something that even crosses my mind to think about and it would feel awkward for me to ask them to stop. Now we have a whole lot more information than if he says, why, why, why are you doing this? I need you to stop. It doesn't feel good. And she says, you're just being oversensitive. Turn to the husband and say, what did you just hear her say? What are the factors in her experience and in her behavior that you know now that you didn't know five minutes ago. And I'm not, you know, we're not here yet to have a conversation about whether you agree with them or not. I just want to make sure that you've heard her. Once we make sure that he's heard her, then I go to him and say, what is your culture of touch? What does touch 
mean to you? What do you believe is being demonstrated when other men touch your wife in this way? And maybe we hear from him, well, you know, there was never any touch in my household as a child. And so the only person you're allowed to touch is your partner who you're in a committed relationship with. And any touch outside of that is disrespectful. Okay, so now we have this fleshed out a little more. It's not just this big, ah, something's terrible, but we have actual information about what he's thinking and why, deeper information. So now I go back to her and I say, okay, what did you just hear him say? Make sure that they're both on the same page with the language that they're using. We have not yet talked at all about whether they agree with each other. Then the next step is, okay, how can we find a common ground between the two of you? If you, husband, now have a deeper understanding of what touch means to your wife, do you feel like you can have a little more comfort, a little more security in it? If you, wife, now have a deeper understanding of why this is so uncomfortable for your husband and it's not just like a hysterical reaction, can you think of ways that you might be able to meet him halfway? And through the process of this iterative conversation, where at the end of each piece, I'm asking, talk to me about what you heard her just say. Can you talk to me about what you just heard him say? We're constantly making sure that they're on the same page so that they're not making assumptions and just acting from their own beliefs about what is normal, what is okay, what is respectful, you know, all of that stuff. Eventually, hopefully, by the end of this session, we get to a place where they have enough understanding and enough knowledge to respect each other's point of view and act on whatever compromise or halfway meeting we have identified and agreed on. And it may be that we say, okay, for the next week, you're going to try option A, which is wife, you're going to make some boundaries with your friends. Shoulders are okay. Waist is not where men's hands can go. Meanwhile, husband when you see this and you feel yourself starting to get heated, we're going to help you find something that you can focus on to remind yourself that this is not a threat to your relationship. This is not disrespectful. We're going to help you to calm your nervous system down. We're going to spend a week or two or a month or whatever practicing this and see how it goes. If it goes great, and the problem is solved, fantastic. If it doesn't, and there are still issues, then we come back to the table and we go to the next level of negotiation. When Abby says, you should just get a divorce because she's never going to change. That doesn't allow for the fact that there's never been any real communication between the two of them. So if you found this interesting and you like the way that I talk about or think about dealing with couples, I want to let you know that I have the Relationship Tune-Up, which is um, a service where for about the cost of a reputable oil change, you can get me to look under the hood of your relationship. You tell me sort of what the things are that's going on. The steering wheel is pulling to the left and the brakes are squeaking when I go around a curve. You know, the relationship versions of that. And then I will talk you through the issues that I see that are hindering you from having the close connected relationship you desire. So if you're interested in that, it's the relationship tune up. The link is on the screen now and it's in the description. And I would love to hear, what do you think about Abby's advice? What do you think about my advice? Do you swear at Abby? Swear at me? <laughs> Leave a comment below. And please don't forget to like, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, get out there, communicate like adults. And if all else fails, take a nap. Everything looks better after a nap. Have a good day.